could there not be a regime in during World War II? One of their prison camps had been inundated with attempts to escape. And they were so overwhelmed by that that the leaders developed a plan to slow all of that stuff down. And the plan that they devised was they're going to keep the prisoners occupied doing work. And if they were too busy doing work, then they wouldn't have time to plan escapes. So they trucked in a bunch of rocks, put it in one side of the camp, and told the prisoners to move it to the other side. And after they moved it to the other side, they told them to move it back. And they kept telling them to go back and forth and back and forth. Well, the prisoners began to go crazy. So they ran into the electric fence to commit suicide. They tried more escapes in, in hopes that they would be shot. And of course they were. So why did the prisoners go crazy? They didn't see a big purpose in moving the rocks from one place to the other and then moving it back. See, they didn't see a purpose greater than themselves. They thought the work was meaningless. But the plan worked for the people who devised that purpose for the rocks. Humanity is innate with the desire to know the purpose for everything. So, the greatest word that the, that the humanity possesses, that we possess, is the word why. Why? Why do you wake up every day? What is the purpose for your existence? And this is the reason why we ask, why do we have to know this? Why do we have to learn this? when we are in school? And that's a very, very good question and never stop asking. Because you don't want to be brain dead. And as adults, we get a little more brain dead and we don't ask why. And we need to ask more frequently the question why. Later on, we don't use the word, we just say, what's the point? Same as what? In Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, I'm, I'm only highlighting actually the first five verses, but we're actually going to, we're going to deal with more than that. Chapter 1, some in 2, and deal with the question of why. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and He separated the light from the, from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness He called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. So that's the first five verses. We will also deal with some of the other verses in this, especially near the end, where God talks about humanity. But here, what he does is, he sets the tone, he begins with the heavens and the earth and how they were created by God. And the process that he used in order to make everything. So, God is the one who says, I created this, and therefore, and we, we have to understand this, 
Therefore, I determine its purpose. See, the Creator always determines the purpose. If I make something, let's say a program, if I'm a computer programmer, I am, pro I am writing this program for a specific purpose. I determine it if I program it. If I were hired by somebody, he determined it, but the purpose was there. But nobody hired God to do this. He determined the purpose. Whatever it is, he was the one who created it, so he is the one who determined the purpose for creation. So, throughout chapter 1, he establishes the fact that he made it, he designed it, and then, therefore, he determines its purpose through and through. So, here, in verse, let's go to verse 28, starting from verse 26, actually, of the same chapter. Then God said, let us make man in our image in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea, and the birds of the air, over the livestock, and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Then what did he do? Verse 27, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God he created them. Male and female he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. And he says the same thing, exact words, the same thing that he said, this is how I'm going to design it, now I've done it, I'm going to tell you why you exist. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, or, and the birds in the sky, and over every living creature that, creature that moves on the ground. So he set the purpose, created it, and told them what their purpose was. Then it says, Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant in the face of the whole earth, and every tree that has, has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth, and all the birds in the sky, and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food, and it was so. So he started with creation. This is how I created it. I set its purpose for it, and I told the people why they were created. What does bless mean, though? He said, God blessed them and said to them. When man blesses, he wishes somebody or something well. We don't, we don't do a whole lot of that in our society, in American society, Korean society. Uh, we don't do that very much, but there are specific situations where that, that goes on, and it was actually an eye-opening experience for, uh, for me when I learned this after I became a Christian. And that is, in, in the Korean culture, every New Year, whether that be the calendar New Year or the, or the Lunar New Year, we get together, and because of our, the, na the nature of our society, we decided that we were going to do it in, do it in January 1st. So we go to my mom's house, because my father died when I was nine, and all of us, the, the children, send our kids also uh, there, and we all come together, and we do what we call uh, sebet, which is, you know, formal bow. Right? And when we do the formal bow, what our parents do, whether it be our, you know, grandparents or aunts, they hand us an envelope. Well, my parent, my mom doesn't hand me any, any more envelopes. She hands it to my kids, my grandchildren. And she says a word of blessing. And it was incredible. Because she said, to your good health, to your well-being, may you prosper. And I'm going, oh, that's a blessing. She's wishing... As well. Well, God does that too, but it's more than that. When God blesses, He's saying, thrive. Right? Okay. He's saying,
same tribe. You have been designated to thrive. As a matter of fact, I want you to attain to the level for which I created you. In other words, don't just stay there. Thrive. Get to the point where I have called you to get to. In other words, what he is saying is, be in the center of my will, and my will, will is for your well-being. I want you to be well. Thrive, multiply, enjoy life, relationships, and find satisfaction in your labor. Adam and Eve and the rest of humanity were called to this before the fall. In verse 31 he says, he made everything and said, it's all good. No. Verse 31, it doesn't say it's all good. It says, it was very good. Not that it's just good anymore. It's very good. It's the best. And when God designed or created us and creation... He gave humanity a responsibility and the resource, resources to fulfill the responsibility. This was his purpose. Okay? And what God is saying, remember when God creates something and when he says something first, it determines everything afterwards unless he alters it later on. So from the very beginning, we grab that and we run with it until he says no. So our responsibility, fulfill your responsibility. Fulfill God's calling for your life. And humanity was created in the image of God. They were called to fill the earth. They were called to subdue the earth and rule over all the living things, the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, every living creature that moves on the ground. Now, before you misunderstand, I'm going to remind you, maybe you didn't know. Do you think that we have enough people on the planet? Is God saying, stop, only have one child? Maybe two, if you can afford it. Is that what he is saying? Did you know that the entire population of the world can fit in the state of Texas? Absolutely. With a nice house and a nice yard. The entire population of the world can fit in the state of Texas. Did we subdue? Did we cover the planet? No. So don't misunderstand that we are overpopulating the earth right now. That's a lie. And if that's the reason why you're only having one or two kids, or you determine, well, I'm only going to have one or two, or maybe three. If that's the reason, then you're believing a lie. So the primary responsibility that we have is to take care of the planet and all of its occupants. That's our calling. That calling has not been taken back. So are you taking care of your planet and all of its inhabitants? And in this command, the responsibility that we have, we have been given the inherent calling. It is intertwined that if we want to take care of the entire planet, then we would have to be fruitful and multiply. Adam and Eve could not subdue the entire earth by themselves. I mean, it's a big planet. So how, are we, how are, were they supposed to subdue the, the entire planet when there were just two of them? So inherent in the command of taking care of the planet is the necessity to be fruitful and multiply. They needed offspring to do it. They had to have the ability to procreate. This is the reason why we need discipleship. From 12.30 to 1 o'clock today, we're, we're going to be discussing that because the, the discipleship program is beginning. What a timely message. Uh, I didn't intend to do that. Uh, 
with the timing of it. It just happened. Okay? So the Lord is sovereign. It says, be fruitful and multiply. And you can't subdue the earth without being fruitful and multiplying because Adam and Eve were just two people. We can't subdue the entire world by ourselves. It's impossible. So let's say Adam was in Palestine and he had to take care of Russia. Well, back then they didn't have jets. All they had were horses. But you can't you can't ride a cheetah, even though they're they're fat and they can't run 70 miles per hour for that long. So it's going to take months to get to Russia to take care of Russia. You can't do it. So he had to have sons and daughters to take care of different locations and it was supposed to expand and keep expanding. That's why we can't sit by ourselves right here and be all cozy. One of the reasons why the Tower of Babel was busted up was because they wanted to be cozy. But what are, what are the resources that he gave us in order to do this, besides the command to take care of the planet and have more children? In verses 1 through uh, or 14 through 19, light was given to us. Stars, moon, etc. And they were to be signs for days and years and months, etc. Seasons. They were given to us for scheduling. Right? We have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. That's a schedule. We have months, we have years, we have been given six days of examples of how God created the planet. On day one, he created this. Day two, he created... Could he have done it all at once? Absolutely. But he didn't. Why did he do that then? He set us an example that we can't do it all at once. So now we have to schedule. We have to use the calendar. I'm using my calendar every day because I know what's coming up. I have a little reminder. I have a calendar on my bathroom. I go into my bathroom and I see what's coming up. I have three months of it. And then it, it, he gave us food. We're going to need food, aren't we, to survive? So verses 29 to 30, he gave us seed-bearing plants, Fruit, fruit with seed in it, etc. And if you observe that, you'll see that he gave provisions for humanity and for animals and plants. And we'll say more about that at another time. And then he gave us paradise. In chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, what he talks about is God planted a garden and put Adam and Eve in there. Must have been a gorgeous garden to live in. I mean, God planted it. And he's preparing heaven for us. Must be gorgeous up there. And then he gave us limits. In, in verse 17, he says, just don't touch, not touch. Just don't eat from this tree. You can't have this fruit. The fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And then afterwards, in chapter 20, verses 20 through 24, the intimacy, the fellowship of the husband and wife was initiated. So he gave us companionship in our purpose and our work. So the greatest intimacy that we can humanly experience is in the husband and wife relationship. It is one aspect of a relation, human relationship that is totally compared to our relationship to God. That's why marriage is so sacred. 
And if we throw it in the trash, well, guess what? That's the kind of relationship and mentality you're going to have about relationships. And you're going to be lonely even if you have one, if your mindset is not the value that God has placed in the husband and wife relationship. That's why you never walk away from your wife and you never walk away from your husband. Then what he did was, he threw a wrench in the work after the fall. When Adam and Eve decided to rebel against God, he gave us turmoil. Now we have added resources, but they're negative. Now we have relational tensions between husband and wife. We have difficulty in cultivating the land. Thorns and thistles and, and weeds are naturally going to grow to make our lives difficult. And then, internally, we are innate with shame. The reason why you're wearing clothes right now, right now, the reason why you're wearing clothes is evidence that God has put shame inside of us from birth so that when you realize that you are not a perfect human being and that people are watching you with evil eyes, then you are feeling guilty, <clears throat> ashamed. And he gave us that to help us walk through life and give us an understanding of who he is. And then lastly, he gave us a fear of death so that we will avoid difficult difficulty and ultimately anything that will cause our early demise. <clears throat> well, humanity has been doing a very, very bad job ever since. And I believe that one of the reasons why some animals went extinct is because we were totally neglectful and irresponsible. The bison in the <clears throat> in the plains of the United States were almost hunted to extinction when they just shot them from trains just because there were so many. And eventually they had to be put on the endangered species list because they just almost wiped them out. And what a shame, just didn't want to eat it, uh, didn't want to get their hide, it was just for fun that they took their rifles from a train and shot the bison. That's total irresponsibility of humanity. They weren't taking care of the planet as God intended them to take care of. Then what happens is we come to the New Testament and we go to Matthew chapter 28 verses 19 through 20. And everybody knows this passage of course because it's quoted so many times and it is declared to be the greatest commission. Well, people say Great Commission, but I say it's the Greatest Commission, because it's a superlative. Right? And this is the reason why you went to there to share. My 14-year-old also went. Jonah. And in the New Testament, we read this in Matthew chapter 8, verses 19 to, to 20. Right? <coughs> Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. When we go to the parenting class, or when we start the parenting class, we're going to actually really blow this up, scrutinize it, and take the microscope to it. But here, Jesus is commanding us to make disciples of the planet. Well, what were, we, what were we supposed to do in Genesis anyway? We were supposed to take care of everybody and its inhabitants. Well, who's doing that? Not very many people. The world is going to pot. It's decaying. It's, it's getting dirty. It, we're, we're ruining it. Why are we ruining it? Because nobody's listening to God. So what do we have to do? We have to get people back to where they're listening to God again. And so Jesus comes and says, you need to make disciples of everybody because everybody needs 
a relationship with the Lord, with the Heavenly Father. And so when he commands us to go and make disciples, it is, it is intentional. But all the commands of the Genesis passages, everything that God told us to do in Genesis, has not been retracted. We don't stop doing that to do it. It's a really, really well uh, blended marriage of the two commands. In other words, Matthew passage is an outworking of the Genesis passage. Since nobody is listening to God, we have to get people to listen to God. So then the Genesis passage will be obeyed. If we are to disciple other people, it already assumes that we are discipling our own. If we are going to disciple those outside of our family, how much more are those inside? If we are not discipling our own children, then we've already failed. Even if we are discipling those on the outside. That's why a pastor, when he has bad kids, he's a bad model. <clears throat> because if we can't take care of our own family, how can we take care of the church, Paul says. I mean, he's saying it as though, I don't even have to say this. <laughs> you guys should already know this. It's so intuitive. And go is just as vital as make disciples. You can't make disciples by, by not going. And you can't fill the earth and subdue it without multiplying. So I'm going to keep the reality of life in front of you by sharing with you this, when I went to a missions conference in, this was Virginia, it was, it was done by a Baptist organization and, and a bunch of pastors from all over the country came, came to it. And all these missionaries, because the mission organization, the Southern Baptist organization, had a headquarters or, or regional headquarters there. And we just bust them in every day, two, three, four sets of them. And we constantly got bombarded with all the experience and mentality and all that, uh, that that was taking place. And one illustration was just vivid. He had a big screen and he projected a dark, uh, of course, just the same size and it was just black. Because this, he says, this is the world. And if the entire surface area or the, or the area was, was humanity. He says, this is, it, this is the number of people who are designated to disciple them. And he had like a little white dot in the middle. So the number of evangelicals who are intentionally discipling this world was like a dot. And comparatively speaking, we don't, we don't have enough people. And when Jesus said, you know, the, the, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few, I mean, that was vivid. And then he said something even more amazing. He said, Muslims are encouraged to have eight children per family. Eight children. What they want to do is they want to control the world, or take over the world by sheer population. Because they have a purpose. They're, be, they're being intentional about taking over the world. And as Christians, I'm going, we bought into the American dream. We only want to have two. Why? Because children are in the way. They're expensive. And I'm thinking, who are we living for? Are we living for God or are we living for ourselves? They've already taken over France. 